Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Julian, and welcome to Beer Bootcamp Sessions. With me today, I have got none other than the Emmy nominated for Beer Geeks Master Brewer, Mr. Michael J. Ferguson. He's the pioneer in the craft beer world amongst the first genuine beer geeks. How's it going, everybody? Michael started uh, brewing his career as apprentice under brewer Gordon Biersch at the brewing company in Palo Alto in 1990. Jeez, I was very young then. Um, <laughs> Michael's first brew was a German Dunkel, a dark lager, and very much one of his favorite styles. Good day, Michael. How are you keeping? I'm keeping very well. How are you doing, Julian? No, I'm good. Thank you very much. You know, things are very much... Uh, under lockdown here in uh, South Africa at the moment still. And that is why we have introduced um, these beer boot camp sessions to keep everybody's minds active. And oh, that looks delicious. And yeah. um, we're gonna be talking about beer. And this evening, we're gonna be talking about the American homebrew scene. I know that you've been working at a homebrew shop and uh, you can tell us uh, what the brewers are brewing. First of all, what ingredients they're ordering, anything new, fancy, um, that kind of stuff. And as well as obviously equipment and things that a lot of the homebrewers um, are getting from yourself. So uh, please dip right in and we'll take it from there. Okay. Well, you know, it, what's very popular obviously is the, uh, uh, is the brewing equipment and a lot of people are getting these spike brewing uh, kettles and uh, fermenters but still the grain father is, is probably the number one item. Uh, big difference between the grain father we get here and the grain father you get in South Africa. The grain father here is only 110, 120 voltage and it's very difficult to attain a boil with the 110, 120 voltage. The 220 works much better. Why don't they have a 220 version here in the United States? Well, apparently they will have in about six months. So we will be getting a version of the grandfather here stateside that will actually reach and attain a boil. <laughs> and tell me that on that the, the, the grandfather. Tell me, will it still be converting the AC the 110 to the 220 to get that rolling boil? Do you and have you got the um, mechanics sorted out with the suppliers, or um, how are they going to achieve that? Well, the the, the thing the, the difference here was um, the uh, United the UL approve UL approval, which is the stateside electronics firm that approves the electronics for the United States was well, very different for the export versions. Um, so uh, we have to go through, a, they have to go through a very different licensing to get the 220 here that they do internationally. Uh, as you know, that as the voltage goes up, the efficiency of the electronics goes up as well. Um, 440 is more efficient than 240 and 240 is more efficient than 120. Uh, that being the case, uh, the, all the people here have been waiting for that 220 to come. Uh, and once, once we get that, then we will have the same sort of efficient boils that you guys get there in South Africa. Uh, it does reach a boil, but you have to use a jacket. You know, you have to use the grandfather parka, whatever they call it. <laughs> yes. uh, some people, you know, wrap it in all kinds of different things so that the heat stays in so they can reach this boil faster. Some people actually uh, start it to boil somewhere else, then put it back into the grandfather. It's just, it's been, uh, it's been an experience. Uh, not to mention, I'm not sure uh, if your versions of the grandfather down there have the same uh, issue, but the circuit breaker on the grandfather here is directly on the bottom. Is that true where you guys are? So, so actually, um, a lot of the products that are uh, manufactured by the same company, the grandfather and the turbo still, which I've got as well. The reset for the element is in the middle, right underneath. So if you do need yeah. to reset it, it is, is just uh, yep. silly to me. 
<laughs> Very good. Um, I'm guessing that your grandfather's also uh, got Bluetooth control, uh, mm -hmm. where you might use your mobile phones to you know, set in your recipes for your getting your water to your mash temperature. Um, you can do then do step mashes, um, mash out at the end, obviously good lighter and then the boil now obviously you guys are heading into summer now would that make uh, the boil a lot easier as well well i say that again will that make the boiler a lot the oil um a lot more efficient now that you guys are moving well, absolutely into because here in texas <laughs> as you know uh, uh after after wednesday we probably won't be below 90 degrees fahrenheit for the rest for the next six months so yeah, that that really does help uh, attain boils faster. But what it doesn't help is cooling the beer. So when you do the pre-cool, um, if you're not going through ice or you're not going through a pre-chiller, uh, you're never going to get your beer down to pitchable temperatures here with just the water coming from the faucet. Uh, you'll have to go into a pre-chiller uh, in, in a bucket of ice to get down below 80 degrees. That's that's one of the issues we have here in, in South Texas. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so we've got the exact opposite. Uh, in, in winter, we'll still get a good rolling boil. Um, but in winter, we're able to chill a lot quicker, mm -hmm. uh, especially here on the high fault where our temperatures um, get very close to zero. And that is why a lot of the home brewers here um, in, in the winter months uh, turn to lagers because they're you know, able to find a cold spot in your in your garage where you're pretty much going to get down to the temperatures that you're going to need to kind of get a lager you know if you haven't got temperature control um and it's a great time to do those those uh, lager beers uh indeed we do the same thing here uh we lager in the winter but our winters are also very mild so we might get one to three days of freezing uh generally though um you've got about three months where you could do loggers. But what a lot of people are using now, and I, and I mean a lot, is uh, the Imperial and Omega Kvike yeast, okay? And that Kvike yeast, like the Loki um, from Imperial, can ferment up to 105 degrees, right? And have no bizarre off flavors. You could actually make a Kolsch or a full lager using this Kvike yeast, fermenting at 90, 95 degrees and not have any of those off flavor esters that you would get uh, if you were using a lager yeast and trying to, you know, brew at this time of year. Also, you don't get the excessive fruity ester that you get when you try to use the regular ale yeast either. And uh, there are examples of Kolsch and lager-like beers being made start to finish in eight days. From start of brewing to being in a keg, eight days later and tasting damn good. <laughs> so, so, so you also seeing a big uptake on the, the, the Kvik, the Kvik, the, the, the Norwegian beast yeast, as they call it, um, simply because a lot of the home brewers, as well as us as commercial brewers, have found that you don't need to cool or use that much energy to cool because, yes, it ferments at a very high temperature. It gets a super fast fermentation and you're done in a couple of days. You crash it and you've got really, really good beer. So are you selling a lot of that yeast at the moment as well? We are. What we do is every every three months, we, we, uh, we order the stuff special uh, and we allow all our customers, and we have several clubs, uh, the KGB, uh, the CIA. These are all names of our various clubs in the Houston area. CIA is the Cane Island Ailers. The KGB is the uh, Kirkendall Grand Brewers. We also have down in Webster, Texas, where NASA is, uh, we have the Mastronauts. <laughs> oh, so we've really got, cool. and I think there's another group called the, the Ninja Brewers. Uh, so we, we have a, a lot of those people calling up, asking for this. So every three months or so, we do a special order of the Kabaikis. They can go online, pre-order it, pay for it. And when it comes into the shop, we just send it out to them so that they will have their, um, their summer yeast basically. And, uh, and right now we've got, I don't know, maybe 
maybe 50 different types of yeast coming from Imperial for the summer because so many people just want, you know, a yeast that can handle the weather out here. Yeah, that's very good. So yeah, so obviously you, you're selling a number of, of, of the strains. I know of the, the Oslo, the Loki, uh, the mid busts, all that kind of stuff. Do you have any other strains? <laughs> oh, really? So you got a number of strains? Uh, yeah, we, but like I said, we special order. We don't want to keep a bunch of strains hanging around that we don't sell because, you know, I mean, doing yeast at a home brew shop is, it's, it's, it's a juggling thing. Uh, you don't want it to go bad, you know, because it goes out of date in six months. So if you have too much yeast and six months later, you still have it sitting on hand, you're just throwing that stuff away. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but it, you know, that's, that's what happens. You, do, you, you, you have perishable products which is why we're still open. Basically, we're considered a grocery store and that makes us an essential business. Now, I understand in South Africa, the home brew shops aren't open, right? Correct. So at the moment, we um, have a lot of home brew shops that are very much closed simply because they do not deem it as an essential service. Uh, tell us how you got around that from your side. <laughs> well, I mean, if you look at it, it's, it's like this. First of all, they they consider liquor stores an essential service here in Texas. <laughs> so um, uh, liquor consumption has gone up by 65% since, since the lockdown, okay? An unfortunate byproduct of that is domestic violence has gone up about the same, but that's a different story. Uh, when it comes to our home brew shop, we basically sell groceries. We sell perishable products, we sell kitchen items, and we sell uh, produce, pops or produce, right? So we qualify easily as a grocery store, which is an essential. Product. Now you're getting you're getting glare off my glasses, aren't you? Let me let me try no, this. No, you're good. You're good. You're good. No, it's fine. Yeah, is it no too dark? No, no, that's no, good. Dark good. Never mind. <laughs> There you yeah. go. <laughs> oh, he's back again. Excellent. Sorry now, about tell that. me about uh, tell me about obviously you, your your main um, malt that you sell there, um, and ah, yes. that would obviously be your pale. Um, tell us about the 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 malt bulls that are kind of going out at the moment. What are the people brewing? Well, you know, it's it's interesting. At the start of this whole thing, we had a lot of people brewing um, big beers and New England IPAs. We sold. We sell a lot of British yeast to make these things. We sell a lot of Marisotter. We sell a lot of Golden Promise, uh, a lot of uh, Belgian Pilsner, uh, domestic Pilsner, uh, a lot of domestic pale ale malt and Belgian pale ale malt. And one of the biggest ones right now going out because uh, a lot of people were making box at the beginning, strong beers, um, a lot of uh, Munich one, Munich two, and uh, German Pilsner is going out there. But as weeks went on, uh, people started brewing different things. They, now we seem to be brewing things that are easier to drink. Uh, in one day, I had seven recipes come through for Mexican lagers. <laughs> and uh, right now, everybody seems to be going for cream ales. All right, so there's a lot of corn going out there, a lot of rice going out there, uh, and people are making these easy drinking beers, including uh, British Dark Miles, which is uh, a low alcohol, very tasty malty beer, uh, which I truly enjoy. But it's making a resurgence here in the United States. Uh, a lot of people um, don't like Miles because the, the, the first thing they look at is, well, it's only like 3.7%. I don't want that. So you have to name it something that, uh, you know, that people think is exciting, like, um, you know, um, you know, walrus pee or something like that, you know, so uh, that all these, all these lighter drinking beers are making a resurgence during this lockdown, uh, simply because I think that people want to be able to drink the beer and not have to like take a nap halfway through the day. <laughs> yeah, so they're brewing obviously light and fluffy stuff that you can basically session, mm -hmm. um, drink uh, more of it because you're not going anywhere and you know um it's very refreshing especially um on a hot day and everything um so yeah, obviously you said that coming up. yeah the the hot days are coming and so another 
huge thing is, is hepabytes. And we run out of white wheat and German pale wheat on a regular basis. And uh, fortunately, we, have, we can get most of our grain locally, but there are some places that we just can't get the grain from reliably. Uh, and so we've had to juggle some pricing and, and, and other things like that just to make sure that we have the correct amount of uh, grain for the, uh, for the people that, that are now getting ready for these hot, hot summer days coming up. And they're starting this week. And like I said, after Wednesday, uh, we, will be, uh, we will be 88 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit you know, on a regular basis. What is that, about 41, 42? Hot. Yeah. <laughs> Hot. And, and humid as well. So we've, we've got the high humidity going. Um, this is where, uh, where all the koozies come out. Now, I, I'm sure you know what a koozie is because you have hot summers too. They're the, the little jackets that go on kegs and cans. Uh, those are yep. very big here because uh, beer sweat. The, the second you pour a cold beer, the second you bring out a can, it just starts putting rings on everything. Uh, and, the, and the heat gets to it. So koozies are very important this time of year. Uh, it's another thing that we, uh, we sell a lot of our, our farm boy uh, koozies um, at this time of year. Most people, like me, I've got maybe 50 of them. So when you give a party, everybody could have a koozie. But uh, unfortunately, no parties this time of year. <laughs> not now, not the oh, COVID-19 gosh. thing. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And tell me, um, on the hop side of things, you said the guys are originally obviously brewing big IPAs, West Coast IPAs, a couple of Nipahs and things like that. Now with the, the, the milder beers, what, what, what hop bulls, what interesting hops are they ordering? Well, this is, this is the good thing. that The New England IPAs can also be low alcohol beers. In fact, a lot of them are. Uh, most of them have very low IBUs, even though they have very high hop and con, uh, you know, uh, hopping uh, content, you might use in a five gallon batch, you might use nine grams of, uh, in nine ounces of hops just to get the flavor and aroma thing going on. And of course the, the uh, usual suspects of the big sellers, um, Mandarina Bavaria has been very popular. We run, run out of that constantly. Uh, all the, uh, the Citra, the Mosaic, um, El Dorado, all those fly out the door, but there's a lot of people that like the seven C's. So the Centennial, the Cluster, the, the uh, Cascade, those are still very popular as well because, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard to beat the an old fashioned pale ale, you know, that was basically Cascade, Centennial, Columbus, you know, from California, West Coast IPAs and West Coast pale ales. And basically the American pale ale was invented by, um, um, Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, and that was that's that was the big thing, you know, high off of Centennial at the beginning, Cascades towards the end, uh, dry hopping with Cascades, still a very popular style of beer for people to drink here. Excellent, excellent. Now tell me, uh, Michael, you brewed an award-winning winning Hefeweizen, obviously, um, you can't drink much of it, but I know you oh. did. What are the top tips for brewing a hiss. Uh, one of the things I found, uh, especially at the GABF, um, all the ones that were winning used decoction. Okay. Now I know that it's a it's a difficult thing for home brewers, but it's not really. Uh, in the Cane Island Ailers, they have a special group called the decoctionists, and they decoct everything. Uh, and so what I what I found with the award-winning hepatitis is, is if you decoct, you're going to get a better mouthfeel and flavor uh, associated with that decoction, even though the beer is going to remain uh, fairly light because you're not really going for the, um, the darkness of caramelization. You're going for the mouthfeel and flavor profile of caramelization when you do the decoction. Uh, something that I find melanoid and can never replace, you know, as a malt. So that's one of the things. The other, the other thing is, uh, you got to, you got to use the right ingredients. It's got to be over 50%, right? I used 55% wheat. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to have a system that didn't need to use rice hulls, but I'm not opposed to rice hulls. I mean, I was, 
I was pure Ryan Heinz the boat my first eight years of brewing. So we didn't use any adjuncts whatsoever, but uh, it wasn't until I left Gordon Beers, which Dan Gordon, you know, uh, a graduate of Brian Stefan was very staunch about the whole, uh, you know, Ryan Heinz the boat thing. But it wasn't until I left that I started actually winning awards when I was on my own uh, at Barley's Casino and Brewing Company in, in, uh, in, in Henderson, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, and I found that if you use white wheat, 55% decoction, make sure you stick to the, you know, the 3068, the vine stuff on 3068, I always use that yeast. Uh, I mean, there's lots of other uh, hepatobites and yeast out there, but I like the 3068 because it didn't have excessive bubble gum and you could regulate how much banana you wanted, all right? Just by picking the correct temperature. So the other secret is between 65 and 68 degrees Fahrenheit is where you want to ferment that, that beer, not 70, 72, 73 degrees like you would do you know, a pale ale when you want those, want those fruity esters from a pale ale. But with the 3068 yeast, that would give you excessive banana, excessive bubble gum, and you do, really don't want that to overpower that whole wheat flavor of the beer. Plus, you want to make sure that you're 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 going to have uh, the correct uh, yeast in suspension. So, if you're going to keg or if you're going to bottle, you're going to want to roll that bottle before you before you uh, open it, or you're going to want to store your kegs upside down so that when you turn them right side up, the yeast goes back in suspension. So it's all, it's all very important. And those are instructions you need to put when you're sending your beers to, to an award show, uh, you need to put those instructions on the bottle, all right? So that when the steward has the bottle and he's about to serve it to the judges, he does the correct thing before giving it to the judges so that you have the yeast suspension, you have the aroma profile that you want. And, uh, you know, one of the biggest things anyway, when you're going to send something to an award show is to keep a library of beers so that you know which ones you need to send. All right. If you're into sending beers for competition, you really need to keep a library so that you know which, which beers and which recipes are the ones that are going to win you awards. All right. You might you have to start somewhere, but as you move along, you will know which recipes are the ones the judges are looking for. Now, yes, judging varies greatly. It's hugely subjective, but you still want to keep within the guidelines of the BJCP and or the World Beer Cup, GABF. What you need to look at those guidelines. And one of the things, uh, so regardless of the beer that you're making, is to invite other people that you, whose palates you trust in to help you judge whether that beer is good. You may be palate blind or nose blind to a fault in your own beer, but others can bring that to the table. Don't get your feelings hurt, <laughs> all right? Because sometimes they're gonna say nasty things about your beer because the beer is, happens to be nasty in some of those libraries, but they are going to point you in the right direction before you send your beer to competition. So rely on your friend's palate. Always good to do that, yeah. We normally do that, yeah. You know, always make sure you're within style, get your friends around, get them to taste the beer. You know, people that are obviously in the, in the beer know and do that and get them to taste your beer. And like you said, expect criticism where criticism is due or complaints where there's a complaint to you know that's that's always a, a very positive thing as a home brewer i'm um, just getting back to hops at the moment where are most of your hops sourced from are they sourced from the from yakima are they sourced all over um where do you get your main source of hops from? that's a good question we our, our main our main source is is yakima chief all right because they also broker the international ones so the australian uh new zealand uh german uh all those hops still come through Yakima Chief. Uh, and uh, the owner of the, uh, of the shop, uh, Landon uh, uh, Beinhauser, uh, he is a, he's the Southeast regional salesperson for Yakima Chief. <laughs> so, 
So uh, this this actually came about after he was the owner of the home brew shop, but because he knows so much about hops, now he's part of their company, which gives us kind of an inside track to some of the experimentals that will be the next big thing, right? Because all a lot of these hops are branded, uh, you know, like Citra and 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 Mosaic. These are brand names, all right? And only certain people can deal with those brand names or they have to pay a premium for it, right? So the next things coming down the pike, there's a lot of experimental hops out there, man. And uh, uh, you want to try every single one of them uh, as a professional brewer, as well as a home brewer, because one of those, one of those experimental hops, one of the several dozen that are out there right now is going to be the next big thing. And you want to be on the forefront of that because you want to get your contract in before, before everybody else. I mean, most of your Citra and Mosaic now has to go on the open market that you want to get because all the, all the rest of it's tied up in contracts. So as a professional brewer, you got to look at these contracts and make sure that you lock down these things as soon as you can. 100%. And also tell me, um, a lot of people here have started moving to uh, cryo hops. Are cryo oh, yeah. hops big in the US? They are. They're, they, and I noticed uh, one of the things uh, during this lockdown is that the usage of cryo hops have gone way up. First of all, they're, they're way higher alpha. A lot of the bad notes uh, have been removed from them and they're great for late addition uh, and dry hopping because of the higher alpha. You could also get your, your bittering in there without, without, your, without the uh, vegetable byproduct that might happen from a long boil. So cryo hops are, 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 are really big. And of course the big ones, uh, once again, Mosaic, Citrus, Centennial, Columbus, Cascade, and uh, Simcoe are, are the ones that we do a lot. And Laurel is out there too, but I'm not a real fan of, of the Laurel hop. I find it a little bit too limey um, for me. And, and, and that's, I'm not saying anything about British people here. <laughs> I, just find, I just find it, uh, it's, it's got a lime um, pulp content flavor that I, I'm not a real fan of if it's used excessively. So, uh, I'm a real fan of blending hops. I'm a real fan of using high alphas at the beginning and flavor hops at the end, so that so as not to, to waste your 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 expensive hops or or the or the hops that are are hard to get. Um, I just as soon use something like a Magnum or or Super Alpha CTZ or or a, or a Centennial if I'm going to bitter at the beginning and then save my Mosaic, Citra, Simcoe slash whatever other hop you want at the end to get the flavor profile because these a lot of your smash beers they use all one hop and you know they use all one grain and that's that's fine but i just would hate to waste my mosaic and my citra and whatever other um you know hard to get hop uh at the beginning of a boil when you could just use a you know a straight high alpha hop and and have less vegetation in your beer so Personal opinion. And then on the equipment side, you said obviously the grandfather um, is still very popular um, from a brewing system point of view. Um, what other equipment, obviously, now you're going to sell uh, a kegging, are you doing corny kegs, are you doing gas discharge, are you doing taps, um, are, are they still buying bottlings, doing bottle conditioning and things like that? Absolutely. So one of the things you'll find here in Texas is that we have not just a lot of brewers, but we have a lot of mead makers. We have a lot of wine makers. Uh, we have a lot of uh, cider makers and they buy a lot of bottling equipment. They bottle a bunch of stuff. Uh, so we're always selling that. We have a lot of brewers that, that still bottle. Uh, me, I, do, I go straight to keg because I find bottling a pain. Um, so it's good to have a Blickman uh, beer gun so that if you want to fill bottles for competition or something like that, if you just go from your pre-carbonated stuff into a bottle, uh, make sure you're clean about it, obviously, cap it up and, and off you go. Also, I still bottle because uh, I like my big beers, barley wines, big stouts, uh, even in the summer. Yes, I'm that guy. Uh, and uh, I will bottle those so that I can lay them down and have them two, three years from now. Uh, I have that sort of patience. My brew buddy does not. He likes to make his 
make the beer and drink it all and then go, wait, we need to make more beer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the bottling equipment is still solid. We still go through, you know, 20 cases of bottles uh, a week uh, easily, but uh, we sell a lot of, we sell a lot of corny kegs. We sell a lot of CO2 bottles. Um, we're, we're, we're actually a, a station for refilling uh, food grade CO2. So we have lots, even, even businesses come to us to get their bottles filled uh, or exchanged for, for full bottles. So we have uh, the full content like that. Sell a lot of taps, uh, a lot of stuff to build keysers. You know what a keyser is, right? You guys have keysers, right? A keg freezer? Yeah, keggers um, and keggers and keggerators. So keysers and keggerators are quite big. Put a temperature yep. control onto the, the keyser side, but if you've got a keggerator, uh, i got one that takes two kegs. A couple of the guys have got, in fact, there's a, a couple of our homebrew experts that have got up to eight. So they've got a really big, you know eight yeah, taps I, at home. I, I remember that now. I, I actually was, uh, last time I was there, I went to uh, a party of the guy. He had eight or nine on tap. That was yeah. Demi, and that's correct, yes, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and, and they were all, all of them were damn good. You know, I was, I was, I was, I was very proud of the, of, of the improvement over that, just that couple of year period from my first visit there to my, to my last visit there of, of how, how the homebrew scene it just got so much better uh, at doing what they do. I was, uh, I was very proud of you guys. And, you know, not to mention the, the, the beer. I mean, I've had several good beers at your place. So, you know, that, that's a different discussion. <laughs> well, thank you. And then tell me, obviously, um, do you still like to cook and pair beer like you did in Beer Geeks? Absolutely. Are you kidding? That's just one of my favorite things to do. Um, I love to cook with beer. I, I love, like, I'm making a shepherd's pie this week, and, and a dry stout will go into that. Uh, I love to um, reduce the big beers down to a tacky substance and use those as the glaze on, on chicken or a glaze on beef. Um, I also uh, enjoy just having a beer that goes perfectly with whatever I need. Okay. And it's uh, once again, usually subjective, but there are some ground rules. You know, you don't want your beer to step on your food. You don't want your food to step on your beer. You want them to complement each other. Some people like them to contrast each other. It's kind of like ice cream and coffee. You, you've got this like, you know, big dark beer with something that you wouldn't consider a dark beer food so that there, there's a contrast there. But uh, I think that the, so there's certain little rules that if you follow them, uh, you can always have uh, a meal that, that goes well with a beer. And uh, one of the first things you probably should do is if you don't have it, you should read uh, Garrett Oliver's uh, The Brewmaster's Table. You know, that is just a great, great guide. Um, uh, Garrett and I, Garrett and I uh, we, we communicate more now than we used to before. Uh, he's, a, it, he's, he's a remarkable speaker. Uh, and we just saw him not too long ago at Fresh Fest. Uh, and he is very, very well placed to be the guy to teach you what and what should not go with beer at, the, at, at, your, at your table. However, once again, uh, I can't tell anybody exactly what they should drink with what they're eating, simply because my tastes are gonna vary greatly from everybody else's, okay? Uh, there are, like I said, a few guidelines. Do you want a, a, a sweet stout with pizza? Probably not, <laughs> you know? Uh, Unless, of course, you are like Hawaiian pizza and, and then, then you just don't like pizza at all. <laughs> I don't know. Tell me you like, like Hawaiian yeah. pizza? Uh, no. Why would you want to put pineapple on a perfectly good piece of food? <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's, now, I, I have put pineapple on steak. And the reason why is because pineapple is an actual, actually a natural tenderizer. All right. Now, I won't put it on a good steak, obviously. It would go on a steak that's like, like skirt steak. Pineapple is great on top of skirt steak, um, as is orange, orange and lemon and stuff like that if you're going to pre-marinate. So, I mean, yeah, there, there, there is a use for pineapple. 
but mostly it should be an upside down cakes and uh, and uh, I don't know a couple of drinks like a pina colada maybe. <laughs> And then tell me your point of view. Are um, a lot of the home brewers there attempting sour beers? Not oh my yes, we, we, kettle that, sour. Uh, I'm glad you asked that because uh, we sell a lot of the uh, White Labs um, souring agents. So uh, everything from bread, pediococcus, lactobacillus. Um, so yeah, they I and and one of the big sour beers right now. Not my favorite, but one of the big ones right now is the Goza, and that is a little salty for my taste, but uh, they are making a lot of those right now. And it seems that now is the time for experimentation for a lot of people. They are just, um, I mean, they, they're just making every beer under the sun right now, and uh, there's a lot of sour beers going on as well. Um, once again, another good summer beer. A lot of your sour beers are are, are going to be easy drinking for the hot weather. And I think that, that just people are just preparing for the summer here, which is excessively hot. So that is a, that is, that's a good question. Uh, I'm, I'm a real fan of sour beers myself, but I'm, I, I tend towards the whole Belgian sour thing. I'm not a real fan of retinomyces. It, it tastes like burning to me, but uh, that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this week we've actually had uh, Maver from White Labs on as well. That was the end of last week. And we've actually had Fowl on talking about uh, uh, Goza and sour beers at the same time as well. So that ties everything up really, really nicely. Um, there was something else that was going around in my head. But, um, There's so much so going on in your head, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> it is indeed. Um, I'm trying to get back to the thread here. Uh, sour beers, so we've tied up with that and everything. Um, when last did you brew? Uh, actually, I, I brewed just before the uh, shutdown. Uh, I brewed at the store on the grandfather, um, brewed a Kolsch uh, the same day uh, that Pat, the guy that works out at the Katie um, Farm Boy Brew Shop, uh, had his grandson. So we named the Colts beer after his grandson, CJ. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to my next brew because I'm, I'm getting a couple of those uh, Kvike geese. Um, and I'm going to do, I don't know, some gigantic fake lager with the, with the Loki from Imperial. Um, I, uh, I find it just easier to brew at the shop because I'm there and I can brew while I'm there. Right, and I, and it, with the with the grain pump, I just pull out my phone and you know a uh, Bluetooth in and everything. I could I could uh, be in the next room, except when the circuit breaker goes and and I have to lift up a a, a, a you know a hundred degree centigrade uh, device to reset it. Well, it's full of five gallons of boiling liquid, but. <laughs> So, so what I normally do is I find it on a counter and I just slide it slightly forward. So I normally put it on a, a counter or an elevated surface. It just makes it a little bit easier that you can then slide it, push the reset and slide it back because like you said, safety well, is important. Yeah, you know what, uh, what we decided to do uh, was to use cinder blocks. So we use the three sides of cinder blocks. We set it on top of the three sides of cinder blocks. So if we have to reset it, all we do is reach under it and and reset it. So we got smart about it. It was just, it's just, it was, uh, uh, you know, I, I, it was a learning curve for me. I had never used the uh, rain bottle before and it was my first experience. Uh, but knowing what I know now, I just, I, I raised it off the ground so I could just like get under there. It's a and, great, and, uh, great idea to do that. One of the comments that we got from one of the viewers is it's funny that because we're kind of in this prohibition uh, status at the moment with no alcohol, there's lots of people doing pineapple beer because you can get good old pineapples, sugar, and yeast still from your store around the corner. Uh, mix it with water, give it a couple of days, um, and make sure that it breathes. Otherwise, it, yes, it will explode. So uh, it is, it, 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 this, is, this is something that's happening as well. Um, we, uh, I myself, I have to admit, I, I made a pineapple hard, hard uh, seltzer. I, I, I did, you know, I was, it was just something to do. I, you know, four pounds of sugar, two gallons of water, two more gallons of distilled water, 
uh, some clarifying agent. I mean, I just, you know, some champagne yeast got up to about 15% alcohol. I cut it in half with the distilled water and uh, set, it, set it on pineapple. Ugh. That's my cat, <laughs> but I'm talking to people he wants to talk to. So. Um, so I have to admit that pineapple comes in handy for, for different things, just not on my pizza, please. <laughs> uh, very, one of the things we have here is that you guys yep, yep. aren't experiencing there, and that is um, we. this is the southern United States, and there are a lot of, shall we say, amateur distillers. <laughs> so we normally don't sell six row unless somebody's trying to make a, a Budweiser clone. But we've been selling quite a bit of it during these this lockdown. A lot of six row, a lot of corn, uh, and a lot of rice, and um, a lot of uh, dextrose. Um, these are all things that are used by the distillers. Uh, they'll come in, they'll buy, I mean, just an insane amount of all kind of stuff, and then um, uh, every now and then I might get a sample of what they do. There's some damn good bootleggers out there. <laughs> yeah, so but, uh, we we actually we actually did that as well. So we've been uh, because uh, we used to make a, a good wash, a good old sugar wash. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of the other guys are getting molasses in now. We're using uh, uh, liquid uh, malt extract. We're using dry malt extract, and all of that to get as obviously as high ABV for a really good. Uh, wash and then obviously doing a stripping run and then doing that as well. So yeah, so um, but once again at the moment we sit in a, a place where we can't get any ingredients. <laughs> right, exactly. In which case, um, uh, Fleshman's yeast and uh, you know uh, and uh, four pounds of sugar would come in very handy. Uh, but also, uh, it seems to me that there should be some online ordering of things that you black guys could probably get there. It might cost a little bit to get it there, but, but you wouldn't need the, the actual ingredients. All you would need to get is some of the yeast and you could probably get that sent there for a pretty decent uh, price. You know, um, that's, uh, I, I, I felt for you guys. Uh, I saw a post from Lucy, that, that, you know, right at the beginning where they said that there was no, liquor or beer or anything like that. And I was like, oh my goodness. All right, it's bad enough you have to sit home for a month, but not to have anything to drink. I was, I was saddened by that. And, um, and I-, I What, you had, a drink, you had a drink, for, and then you had a drink, and then you had a drink for us as well, right? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, simple, simple thing. <laughs> I could go to my liquor store down the corner. They have curbside. I order it online. I drive up, they bring it out, hand it to me through the back window, and boom. <laughs> um, tell me, uh, have you had anybody attempt a raw beer? A what beer? Raw, R-A-W, you know, unboiled. You know these guys that basically do a... Yes, yes. Mash. Um, that is not... And that is not, not so much. Of mine. <laughs> but... Uh, I am absolutely sure that it goes on. We have not sold. Uh, we basically we we don't have a uh, we don't have to worry too much about that uh, here because people can get all the all the supplies they need. But uh, are you experienced with people doing raw beers? Uh, I mean, one or two, yeah. We're, one or two have, it? yeah. One or two have uh, done it. You know. Um, I don't think you get the full body out of it, and I don't think they're all very successful. And also, you, you boil for a reason, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to, to get all the bugs out and the bacteria Absolutely. and the uh, E. coli, and <laughs> uh, especially so if you're it, it, it seems to be that uh, unless you're in prison, you know, making Applejack in the toilet, why would you? Why would you make a raw beer? I don't know, just some people have uh, gotten onto this, you know, to save energy. I think that's the, the only thing that I can think of really is is the only reason why that would be attempting raw beers. Because, I mean, I, I, I would think that even, um, uh, this, is, this is going 
going way back, but when I was a kid, the one of the things of the future were parabolic uh, mirrors for cooking, which is a lot more trouble than it's worth, but a parabolic mirror for, for at least heating things and sanitizing something over 165 degrees would probably be a better idea than, than, than just plain, you know. Not boiling. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's, uh, that's interesting. No, I, that, that's, now I, want, now I want to taste one. <laughs> uh, probably. Uh, so what you can do tomorrow is get grandfather out. Um, well, yeah, but most bacteria <laughs> is, yeah, most bacteria dies uh, between 67 and 70 degrees, anything over 70. Yep. So uh, basically, uh, if you do a match uh, out. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's, then and I think that's you, you just should be. Just to get it up to that temperature would be better than nothing. Right, so uh, that's uh, I mean that that's interesting. So I think a parabolic mirror would come in handy for that, and you can build your own, uh, even using things like foil. You know, uh, that was one of my science projects when I was a kid. But <laughs> that uh, that's a long time ago in a city far, far away. <laughs> um, at the at the brew shop. We are selling uh, right now uh, a lot of newbie equipment. So basically, a lot of people during lockdown decided that they were going to start homebrew. So we're selling all the starter kit stuff, you know, the, the buckets, the syrups, the buckets, the, you the know, malt extract, yeah, brew malt can. Extract, the uh, both liquid <laughs> and dry. Um, yep. Uh, we, we, we have kits that are for like beginners that we pre-package and they're, they, those can't even stay on the shelf. Uh, as soon as we build them, they go out the door. So we have a whole, if, if anything is, is positive about this whole lockdown thing, there's gotta be from just judging from what's happening at the store, I'm thinking there's a 30% more new brewers than we had before the lockdown. So that means there's a lot more people interested in beer out there. And this is gonna be absolutely necessary because I think the estimate is something like 40% of you know, breweries are gonna go out of business because of this, all right? Now, unfortunately that's gotta take the good with the bad because like there, was, there were a lot of breweries out there that probably shouldn't have been out there the growth in here in the United States was, was so big. We, we had hit 8,000 breweries and a good 2,000 of them didn't need to be there, if you want the truth. I won't mention any, anything specifically, but there was easily 2,000 breweries that, you know, they, they started for the wrong reason. Now, some of those might still survive, but what really galls me is that you know, when we got up to 8,000 breweries, we might only have 5,000 when we get on the other side of this, if that many, right? So uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the silver lining is, there's a lot of equipment out there gonna be for sale real soon. Um, and some of it is almost new. Uh, uh, the dark side is that's a lot of businesses out, that's a lot of people losing money, that's a lot of people losing their investments. And, uh, and I and I just don't see that as being a happy ending for anybody. Now we've got the similar situation here, where a lot of the guys before lockdown were already sitting on a knife's edge. You know, um, it's tough out there. Then you get the news that you've got to first of all um, slow down your production, sell it only between certain periods of time, just before a complete lockdown, and then during lockdown, no alcohol, no cigarettes, and then the lockdown was extended for another two weeks. So. We're pretty much here until uh, the 30th of, of April. Uh, there's a lot of uh, speculation on what's going to happen after that. But one of them will definitely not be people rushing out to pubs and bars immediately. I still think they're going to keep the whole social distancing thing, which then becomes a problem. And you've got to change your business model um, either to drive through or delivery uh, packaging for smaller that, but like that. Um, as you said, a lot of smaller breweries um, will definitely not get through this unscathed. 
And that's and that's really unfortunate because a lot of those smaller breweries are actually doing a very good job. I mean, they started small because they didn't want to change, um, you know, the quality of the beer they were making. You when you when you scale up from five uh, gallons to three barrels, that's one thing. When you scale up from five gallons to thirty to fifty barrels, that's a completely different thing. So uh, people with the small breweries, the three to seven barrel breweries. Um, that didn't have package on the market, they're gonna they're they're going to uh, they're gonna hurt. Uh, we've got several breweries here that are doing very well in the package market, all right. Because our grocery stores are still open, they're still selling beer. The liquor stores are still open, they're still selling beer. Uh, so we have that advantage over South Africa that at least some of the places can still get their products sold. But anybody that was depending on their on their uh, tasting room. Uh, for survival, uh, you know, because they 70% of their sales were in house. Uh, that's, that's going to hurt. That's going to hurt um, very seriously. All the breweries and planning, uh, all the money is frozen. Um, my I had three consulting gigs until the lockdown. Now I don't have any of those. So I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a domino effect. Uh, any, anybody in the industry is going to feel this. Uh, the only the only ones that are really doing bang up business are the home brew shops. And you know, that's, uh, um, I don't know, luck of the draw for me, I guess, you know, because like, I- Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, and I think you probably find a lot of competition, uh, going to start chomping down on your heels in the home brew space and everything. But yes, uh, we sit in the similar situation where 90% of our revenue is at the tasting room and people come and take takeaways. We've really started looking at a business model because we've got the canning line. Uh, we're going to look at canning and distributing or even a, a drop off drive through system where people can place their order online or get vouchers and things like that. Come to the brewery, either have a pint while they wait, while they get the order fulfilled, or we can have it ready for them as they come through. Yes. I mean, it's going to take a lot of rethinking and, and, and I feel for you guys because I, I know that, uh, you know that your 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 tasting room and and the restaurant there was was doing rather well, and now all of a sudden it's shut down. and And I understand you're still paying people right now. Yep, yep, we have to. Which That's is one of those things above you know? and beyond. Because I got to tell you, uh, there's a lot of a lot of the businesses here. They just they they couldn't afford to do that, you know. And I and I I, I doubt you could afford to do it long, <laughs> you know. Uh, no, we can't. We can't. Uh, Thirty days is is really teetering on um, a long time. So, but yeah, we're doing we're doing our best to support the guys that that uh, keep the business, you know, uh, working when we're on weekends. You know, that's it's our it's a team that we work together. Um, we're going to sustain it as long as we can, but obviously after thirty days, we're going to have to relook at at everything and just let them know and saying, guys. It is what it is at the moment, and yeah, it's uh, tough decisions are going to have to be made. Yeah, well, hopefully um, it won't be much longer after that that you can get back into business. Uh, but I don't. I I think a lot of people are going to be a little worse for wear on the other side of this thing. Um, I, I, I'm I'm fortunate. My wife is fortunate. She still can she can work from home. Uh, I'm retired, so I you know I I actually have you know, money coming in from my retirement account. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky, but there are so many people out there that are not, and I feel for them. And I wish there was something more that I could do uh, to engage and, and help these people survive, but it's a worldwide problem. It's not just, you know, South Africa or the United States, it's everywhere. And, and uh, the economy and the new normal is gonna be very, very different after this, you know? Yeah. Very differently. And uh, well, we, we hope doing. that, yeah, we hope that you guys uh, obviously have a, a, a successful um, summer with uh, the homebrew shop. If it continues the way it is, you know, that'll be absolutely amazing. Uh, unfortunately, I believe that once this is over, everybody will have full fermenters, full kegs, and way too many bottles. <laughs> so <laughs> I have a feeling there's going to be a, a probably a, a downturn for a couple of weeks after this is over. Uh, but for now, that's not happening. So uh, I'm, I'm, you know, fingers crossed on that. But like, once again, I, I, I feel for you guys, I know that it's going to, uh, 
uh, I know that's going to hurt a little bit, and I'm and I'm hoping you come out on the other side of this thing doing well. How's Greg doing, Greg Casey? Yeah, Greg's uh, Greg's good. He's also been on uh, on lockdown. He's he's taken to uh, cooking for the apocalypse. Uh, so he's basically taken his his food from his his restaurant to his kitchen, where people have asked him to do certain recipes like beer corn dogs and uh, pancakes and, and things like that. So uh, so yeah, he's uh, he's in the same boat as we are. His entire team, obviously, he's got a a full restaurant. Uh, running in Cape Town with plenty of staff. So, so yeah, um, also hurting a lot, um, I'm sure. But, uh, yeah, I think I saw him earlier online as well. But uh, he was online earlier. But uh, all good, all good. I'm sure we will find out very soon um, we what we're going to be doing here. Um, we will get to the other side. And, uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, you'll come out... Uh, um, you know, hitting the ground running and, uh, and, and bring your stuff back up. Uh, it's, I, I, I really hope that everything works out for everyone concerned. Uh, it's just, um, I'm, I'm saddened by the whole thing. And, uh, and I consider myself extremely lucky. So. Yeah, hundred percent. So, so on that cheery note, what we need you to do, um, we've got uh, people saying you've got a magical laugh, and we need to package your laugh. So, what we'll do is we're going to sign out with that, Michael Ferguson, in Texas, USA. Thank you very much for joining us on uh, Beer Bootcamp Sessions. We wish you and your family all the best. Stay Good safe. Time. Thank you very uh, much for well. having me, and I, I wish the same for you and all of South Africa. Um, I missed the place. Uh, you, uh, South Africa was a very welcoming place to me. I enjoyed it tremendously. I can't wait to get back. And I hope all of you the best of luck during these odd, odd times. Michael, thank you very much. Take care. All the best. Keep well. Bye-bye. I will indeed. Bye, y'all. <laughs>